Set in Philadelphia, follow Camille Ebony as she discovers the woman she was meant to be in the blink of an eye, seemingly when her marriage career and life are rearranged, when a cool stranger enters the mix. She realizes for the first time in her life that she is able to throw caution to the wind and just be herself without any label or duties attached. All things must come to an end, though, and once again, Camille finds herself taking on the requirements now of wife and mother. But when she is called upon to do one more favor, the journey to the heart of the matter continues and she comes face to face with the realities of the girl she once was, the person she has wanted to be, and the woman she is. On the road to self-discovery, Camille soon realizes there must be some casualties. <laughs> In the name of our ancestors, peace forever and always. And welcome to another edition of what I call <clears throat> Reality's Temple on Earth Internet Ministry. I am the gatekeeper or the host of this program. Wherever you may find me, I am known as the Mate 
mighty, mighty. Mm. Angel snub nub seven. I am your soul brother, number one. All right. Tonight, we have a special guest, uh, host, lecturer, and I am going to say uh, a few words before we bring him on and I introduce you to him formally. You have probably seen him on certain events like Soul Liberation Day. That's probably the first time you've ever seen this brother. He's going to come before us tonight and talk with us. And uh, I hope that you enjoy or can at least understand where our brother is coming from. I would like to open uh, this broadcast with a, just a short brief talk about what many of us call black unity. Prior to coming on the air, <laughs> I was on Facebook uh, going back and forth with some brothers, uh, some of them uh, strangers, and one brother I've known since 2007, I think, even before I started making videos. Um, hey, how you doing there, brother twin? Twin is always here with us. <laughs> twin, thank you for joining us, twin. Um, yeah, I've known this brother before I even came to uh, YouTube, because I came to YouTube in 2007, but I had a little blog. Uh, I think the blog, I did the blog in 2000, it had to be 2006, early 2006. And I've known this brother since, since that time, way before YouTube videos. And he's still blackity black, 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 you know, all that type of thing. And I want to make something perfectly clear. I have never, and if YouTube had kept our old channels up the way they was, I never made a claim or said I was pro-black, pro-African, none of that stuff. I never said that. I always said I'm a pro-humanity channel. However, my top priority is the people I come from because we need the most help. And I come from this people. I never said and was tripping on blackity black. I never made videos bragging about my skin color. I never made videos talking about how great melanin was. None of that type of thing. I never been blackity black. I never said that the black man was God. I never said that the black woman was God and we kings and queens. I never said those things. The only thing I ever done was seek freedom, justice, and equality to an oppressed people. I'm not tripping on skin color. Skin color is irrelevant. It was skin color that put us in the condition that we're in because of our skin color. Why would I want to continue to bathe and promote in something that put you in jail to begin with, that caused this problem? Black, African, Negro, African, all these are labels and identities created by the Pecklewood. You want to call somebody a coon and an Uncle Tom and a son? All those words, all that come from the white man. All of it do. You too stupid to come up with your own uh, words of degradation and mockery. Right? But you a king and a, and a queen and a goddess and all this stuff, and you want to call somebody names, and you have to use the words that you got from your masa because y'all one and the same. Now, this is not everybody. I'm cool with many brothers and sisters who are pro-black and pan-African because we have an understanding. And just because, and just, just you have the right to feel and think how you believe. I also have that right. Respect mine like I respect yours. However, Nothing is above me as a person or no ideology or belief is above scrutiny. You can talk about my Mississippi campaign all that you want to. You can talk about me. Now, the thing about talking about me, you really don't know me. You might, you hear some things that come from my mouth. You only know what I want you to know, what I let you know. You don't know nothing about me like that. 
and you look stupid trying to talk like you do know me. You don't know nothing about me like that. So you're going to fail trying to debunk, refute, or whatever you want to call it, the Mississippi campaign, and you're going to fail trying to degrade and make mockery of me because you don't know both of them. You don't comprehend the Mississippi campaign, and you don't know nothing about me. So you fail. I would, I would be happy to invite any of you on this forum, this platform, since you know me, and debate that. I know I know me. And bring your evidence and your proof. You only know what I want you to know. And you only say what you think you know or assume. You don't know me. And you don't, you can't comprehend what the Mississippi campaign is about because you're not on that level. You're on the level of sweeping floors, cleaning toilets, while I'm on the level of building buildings and cities. <laughs> All that you know how to do is clean them. I build them. That's where I'm at. But my elder is here tonight to talk to us because I am interested in our unity. We have more similar in common than we do in difference. You spend too much time tripping on what you don't like, what you disagree with. I don't. I concentrate on those things I can embrace from somebody. You can't tell me. Out of all the videos and everything that I say, you disagree with everything I say. It's impossible. I don't even play that game. There are things that Tariq Nasheed said that I can agree with. There are things that Yvette Cornell say I agree with. Minister Farrakhan, and the list goes on and on. And I embrace those things. I don't concentrate on the things that I disagree with because really they don't mean nothing. Because as long as you're living with your slave master and his children, that stuff don't mean nothing anyway. It really don't. Because you're, you're a feral Negro slave. Nobody don't care who you think you are or what you're doing. You're just a slave running around. I always, I used to call us backyard Negroes. You know how they let, you know, your, your dog at the house, a house dog, you know, the, 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 the house Negro thing that Malcolm used to say all the time. You know how a dog act when you let him out the back door into the big back backyard and he get to running and flipping around? D Mr. Puppy, you still locked up. You ain't free. You just got a larger area so that you can run. You still a house dog. And the dog don't even want to be out there that long. The dog just want to go out there, you know, poop a little bit and run right back into the main house. And that's how we are. That's the mentality that we have in this country. I'm the only one on YouTube, on this, on this forum. I'm the only one that have shown interest in what we call black unity. I invite this brother tonight. We've had our conversations. We don't necessarily have to agree, but he's here. And if you go through some of my channels, maybe even this one, you will see I have new videos from Brother Polite, Young Pharaoh, Minister Farrakhan, and the list goes on and on. I promote us. They won't promote me, but I promote us because I really want unity. And I can compromise and I can work with anybody. Hell, I was locked up with, with supposed to be crazy folks. I work with them. Now these are supposed to be insane folks and they told me it's impossible to get them together. Well, I done it. I told them we're gonna boycott the so-called rehabilitation in this place until we get what we want. So that morning we had talked that night what we're gonna do and they came in and thought it was gonna be an ordinary day 
and it was not an ordinary day for them. Everybody refused. And they said, they said, talk to, well, I wasn't Talik at the time, but talk to me. I'm the mouthpiece. Talk to me. They was like, looking at that way. They like, they couldn't believe it. And of course, they thought everybody was going to be scared. Everybody get, go to, to your classes, go, you know, do what you, and everybody refused. Which I said to them, what you going to do? We already locked up. What you going to do to us? Beat us? You're not going to do that. You can't deny us breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What you going to do to us? We already locked up. Now, there are some things that we want that you should be giving us according to your own policy. These demons wasn't even following their own policy. You don't give us what you said that you're supposed to give us. They gave up. It didn't take long to, for them to give up to our demands because all the other workers, if we don't go to these so-called rehabilitation programs, they're not going to let these staff stay on the job. They're going to have to go home. So we talk, they negotiated with me. I was backed up by my people. And it was white, white folks there. Uh, it was a Chinese guy and, and other people, whatever, male and female. But we decided to stick together and we got what we wanted. And guess what? About a week later, they transferred me out of the place. <laughs> and then when I came back, it was right back to the way they wanted it. <laughs> Woo, see, that's why they assassinate our leaders. See, because they knew I was the one. So they got rid of me and everything went back to normal. So if I kill Malcolm X, if I kill Dr. King, if I kill these leaders, they know once you kill the head, the body will fall. That's what I fear and that's what I don't want in building the Mississippi campaign. It shouldn't make no difference whether I'm there or not. You know what to do. You'll lead unto yourself. Take care of business. I might betray you. I might mess around and a pretty white woman might show up and I'm like, wow, you know, they offered me a couple of hundred mil. I'm like, okay, you know, forget that Mississippi campaign thing. You should call me a traitor and set up a posse to blow my brains out and keep rolling. That's what you need to do. But it's about unity arguing and debating back and forth, calling people names over ideologies. And we we still in the same hole together. And I'm going to say this, I'm going to bring our brother on. There was a a movie. What was the name? The Defiant Ones. I think that was the name of the movie. It was a prison movie about a soul brother and a white guy. And there was some kind of big riot or whatever. And they had the opportunity to escape prison. Problem is, they was <laughs> twins and leading white women alone. <laughs> uh, hey, they 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 uh had an opportunity to escape prison, but the only way they could, the problem they had was they were shackled together, and the brother didn't like the white guy, and the white guy didn't like the brother. But if they want to escape prison while they had the opportunity, they had to work together to get out of there. So as the movie continues, they don't like each other. They're going, trying to find a way to get out of these shackles. Uh, I don't like you. And, you know, you don't like me. I don't like you. All this attitude. But in the end, now look, this is what happened in the end. While they were shackled, struggling together in the same situation, working together they didn't have time they was on the run they didn't have time to debate are you a christian are you a muslim are you this are you that they didn't have time for they was on the run shackled together they trying to get loose they trying to get free see we got too much time on our hands because if we didn't have this kind of time i don't have time to be arguing and debating with you over are you committed are you Hebrew Israelite? Are you this? You got too much time on your hand. Those men didn't have time like that. They on the run. They trying to trying to get free. They serious about that. Now in the end, 
once they got shot, uh, got free. The ironic thing about the whole situation was they they liked each other in the end. They they learned about each other during that struggle. See, if instead of arguing and debating, if we really was working on getting these damn shackles off our ankles, once we finally get those shackles off, all that debate and arguing at the end of the struggle, you said, man, you ain't as bad as I thought you were. Brother, because we struggling and we really working to solve this problem. But you have those who are perpetrating the fraud. They're not real about things because if if you real about yours and I know the only way I can get free, I'm depending on you. I got to work with you just like these two men. I got to work with you. And at the end, the story didn't even have to end like that. The story could have ended. Well, the brother go his way. The white guy go his way. And so you don't have to you don't have to like me. You don't have to love me. Once we get these shackles off of us, you can go your way. You can go north and I can go south or whatever. But I guarantee you, in the struggle, in the work, in the fight, I depend on you to live. You depend on me to live. It's going to create a brotherhood. That's why a lot of people in the military, especially when they've been at war, they don't care if you're homosexual. They don't care if you're black, white, Korean. When you are in the trenches, and you got bullets going back and forth. That's my brother. That's the man that got my back. And usually they have a different attitude coming up out of the trenches than they did when they went in. Because that man is the reason why I'm alive. And maybe that man is the reason why I'm alive. He saved my life. And he probably died on the battlefield protecting me, saving me. We all, we all we got out there. See, we all we got out here. Once you begin to understand that, then you know you need to get rid of it. I know it's tempting. Y'all like to argue and debate and everybody is right. But we are in a life and death situation and we are at war. And if we want to win, we're going to have to change our attitude and the way we look at things. It's simple as that. If we don't unify, we're done. It's just simple as that. Because I can't do it by myself. You can't do it by yourself. It's not going to happen. We don't have enough power in ind individuals and we don't have no power in individual groups. It's not going to work. It's not going to happen. We have to find a way, like I always say, go in a room and y'all don't come out the room, order you some vegan food or whatever you need, a movie or whatever. Stay in that room till y'all get yourself together, solve your problem. When you come out, you are unified. One plan. One goal, one purpose, one vision, win or lose, one direction. That's where we go and go for it. That's the way you have to be. Until you have that mindset, it's, we're not going to be able to go nowhere. Twins said, no unification, no liberation. They go hand in hand. It's not going to happen. I don't care how beautiful you think your plan is or what you're doing, it's never going to happen. And right now, we're moving too slow. And the reason why we're moving slow is because we're not unified. We have to pick up the pace. We're not even on the level where they was at during, during the 1960s. We're not even on that level. We're moving like the tortoise, real, real slow, when we should be moving like rabbits. If we don't have uni unification is the fuel to get this job done. There was a song by Big Daddy Kane not too long ago. Rap song, I get the job done. Let's get the job done. Let's unify. Stop tripping on our differences. I was watching Brother Maurice live stream last night. And we, we tripping on our differences and what I don't like or whatever. So that's more important than your liberation. That's more important than making toilet paper so that you can wipe your own backside. That's more important than creating your own electricity and your own gas and building your own houses, controlling and making your own laws and doing your own thing. That's more important, arguing and debating with somebody, than the creation of a reality 
that you claim that you want that's just your imagination for the for the time being instead of you actually being active to make it a reality we here this is the reality step on earth i'm not interested in your dreams and your fantasy and woulda shoulda coulda i don't care about that stuff look what they did in egypt i don't care about what they did 30 years ago five thousand i'm thinking about the now what can i do with my brain with my hands what can i accomplish once you start accomplishing something and seeing something viable and substance i guarantee you'll change your mind the reason why you arguing and debating and going back and forth because you're not producing nothing that you can be proud of and talk about because once you get a taste you want to keep doing it you build one house on two houses three four you want to keep doing doing the do so on that note i'm going to open the floor to our guest speaker tonight which is brother dr omar uh, uh how you said shamsid dean i'm right okay yeah i'm gonna open up the floor to him i have nothing else to say uh ladies and gentlemen if you could applaud Let's bring them all with a well round of applause. You know that's how we used to do in the mind. Bring them all with a well round of applause. Dr. Omar, bring them on. The floor is yours, brother. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I'm uh, appreciative that you allow me to come and share a few things with uh, with your audience. Um, I would like to start off by saying assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. You know, what I chose that particular greetings because of the meaning of it. And I think that the meaning of that particular greetings might point us in a direction to uh, learn to better deal with one another. Uh, assalamu alaikum. That means the what common people say is that it means peace be unto you, mm -hmm. and unto you be peace. The in studying uh, a little bit the Arabic language, I discovered that it means more than peace be unto you. The, the attribute as-salam, as-salam is a, an attribute of what the Muslims call Allah, what the Christians call God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we say as alaikum, we are saying, may God's peace be unto you. Now, the reason I make that distinction is because God's peace can touch each and every last one of us. But what may be peace to me as an individual might not necessarily be peace to you. So I'm saying to you that I don't wish Omar Samsadine's peace unto you. I wish that which is bigger than Omar. I wish that which is called Allah. You know, and that's 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 why I chose that particular greetings. You know, I know plenty of other greetings, but of all the greetings that I have heard, that greeting is a greeting that would make me respect your opinion respect your advice not necessarily that i'm going to follow it but i respect your right to have it. you know so that falls right in line brother Tully, with what you're saying is that one of the uh the interesting situations the problems that we have is we don't respect one another we don't respect that everyone has something of value <clears throat> offer, to offer us, even if it's nothing but showing us what not to do. You know, um, it, it brings to my mind 
the st a story. I think I mentioned it to Brother uh, Talik in the in the past mm -hmm. about the uh, the three the three blind men, and there was a man that was able to see. So what he did was he took those three blind men to an elephant, and he inquired of them to describe an elephant for him. Mm -hmm. Now, he took one of the blind men's hands and he put it on the elephant's trunk to snort. The other blind man, he put his hands on the elephant's ear. And the other blind man, he grabbed the hold to the elephant's leg. The man that grabbed the blind man, mind you, they're all blind. The blind man that grabbed the hold to the elephant's snort, his description of an elephant is that an elephant is like a giant vine. The man that, dis that grabbed the hold to the elephant's ear, his description of an elephant is that an elephant is like a giant leaf. The man that grabbed the hold to the elephant's leg his description of an elephant is that an elephant is like a giant tree trunk. Now, they all, in fact, was describing the part of the elephant that they had. They wasn't describing the whole elephant. And I, and I do believe that if we, as people, as individuals, would recognize that we only have a part of it. None of us are adept enough to know everything. It mm -hmm. brings to, it brings to my mind a a, a, a verse in the uh, the Muslim text, the Holy Quran. It stated that if all of the seas were ink, and if all of the trees were pens, you could not exhaust the wisdom of God. Okay. Now, what is that saying? When I when I when I say God, am I talking about uh, uh, some entity that came into being during the life of Muhammad of Arabia? Of course not, because the name Allah was a mysterious name even before Muhammad, and it's talking about that that is bigger than all of us. You know, I mean, a person could take a look and say, hey, look, man, creation is bigger than all of us. You know, I, I recall going down into um, national parks and would take a, just, just walk amongst the trees. And these trees were so high. It humbled me. You know, in fact, I said, wow, man, this, 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 this planet that we live on is something else. Mm. Not only, not 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 only that, I go down to the ocean and just look out at the vastness of the ocean. Much, much, much bigger than we are as individuals. And once we once we understand that life is bigger than we see it as, we sit around and we condemn this person. We condemn that person. We condemn this people, that people, not realize that we don't got the whole picture. Mm -hmm. We don't got it. We, we only see a little bit of the picture. And once we recognize that, then we can begin to respect each other. We can respect what we, what each other have to offer. It's a, a something I came up with myself is I say that every man that I meet is superior to me in one way or another. That means that I can learn from everybody. Mm -hmm. I can learn from a bum. I can learn from a scientist. I can learn from a doctor. I can learn from a poor person because everyone has something that I don't have. They see something that I don't see. What can you learn from a bum? Omar, Shamsuddin, 
what I learned from a bum, maybe it's what not to do. He is still teaching. He may not have, have what we deem as divine knowledge, but I, I, but I suggest that he do have divine knowledge. If we just have the wisdom to see it. My little talk this evening is on the specialness of black people here in America, the so-called Negroes. Mm -hmm. I have for over 50 years observed what I consider some of the most prominent men and women from our midst and look into what is it they represent, including myself. And what I saw is that most of us, our focus has been has mostly been on what has happened, uh, what hardships was inflicted upon us from others, and some say what we have done to ourselves. Most of their observation was for the most part spot on. In other words, they had a hold to the ear. They had a hold to, to the snout. They had a hold to the leg, but they wasn't seeing the whole picture because we are all blind in one sense or another because blindness also kind of takes ignorance. So we are all ignorant of something. They would so their observation was on the spot. So, yes, the fact of the matter is we were brought here and taken from our our, our, our uh, previous existence in the continent that they now call Africa. That's that's not the uh that's not the name that those people call themselves. Mm -hmm. Brother Tali uh mentioned earlier that these are names that was given by conquerors. The white man did the same thing over there in every country that he went to that he did to us here. Name what he conquered. Leo, African news, and Zepio, African news. These was conquerors that conquered that land and they named the country the country after them the continent after them africa the name african news look it up so it so we were brought over here and deposited into a hostile environment and subjected to unthinkable hardships mm -hmm. and struggles. So when we think about it, every human life, every human life before it is born goes through struggle. Everybody, everyone goes through struggle. It is important that we understand here that our chance, talking about black people, talking about black people here in America, our chance to come into this life was one in trillions. You had to endure the toils and struggles in the womb of the vaginal tract of your mother. You had to fight and race with all of the other sperm, those strings of the sperm, you had to struggle and race with them in order to impregnate the egg. But guess what? Every other human being had to endure the same thing. So you know why I'm telling you, I'm, I'm here tonight to say to you that you are victorious. I'm talking about you, black man, and you, black woman. You are victorious. 
Why is it? Because you made it. Of all of those trillions of sperms that was in, injected into the womb of that vaginal tract, of that woman, of that female, your mother, you made it. And you know why you made it? You made it because you never stopped to complain of how hard it was. For to stop and complain would have meant defeat. It would have meant your imminent death. So you fought and you swimmed. And the mere fact that you made it means that you black people, you black man, you black woman, you are equipped to run this race of life. My message to you is this. There is nothing you are or can be faced with in life that you can't conquer because you have already fought the fight in the womb and you earn this life because you won the battle of the womb. Black man and woman, you are champions. Already, the mere fact that you are here, you are champions. All you have to do is stop listening to people who tell you you are losers. We have been told that we are losers for so long that we have just embraced it. <clears throat> These people that tell you this, we have to see it this way. Uh, it is a good way to see it. That these people are the sperms in the womb. That you that you were racing one, going for the egg to impregnate it. Don't stop and complain. But if you do, you lose and will die in that vaginal tract. That is the lie that we've been told that th that this that we are involved in here in, here in this country. I'm talking particular about African-Americans, Negroes, black people here in this country. Now. We have been told. That when you look at the term and this is something that we all have to think about. When you look at the term race, most of us, I'm talking about black people, we think in terms of color. As opposed to the actual meaning of race. And that is that we have to we have to run a race, an actual race. Every other people that come here to America, the white people that are here, they know and understand that they are in a race, a race for capital, a race for land. But we are focusing on race as a color. And another thing we have to realize about a race is that you don't have no friends in a race. When you get out there on that starting line and you and you get set to go, all friendship ends. You are there to run and you are there to win. You can't stop in the middle of things and say, oh man, look like, look like uh, so-and-so is tired, so I'm gonna help him. No, run the race. Win the race. That's what this thing called capitalism is all about. And whether we realize it or not, we live in a capitalistic society. When you get to the finish line, then you can get together with people and hug them and tell them how great they are. Oh man, you ran a you ran a good close race. No, do that stuff at the end. 
run the race and run the race to win. It reminds me of a, of a joke that I, that I learned when I was a young man in the black community. I don't know, a lot of you, you brothers are kind of young, so you may not have heard it, but maybe you did. It was about, it was a joke about shine. It was stated that in this joke, that there were three people on a, on a boat and that there's a white man, a Jewish man, and a black man. He said that the white, the boat had stopped on them in the water, so they had to find a way to get back to shore. He said that the white man jumped off and started swimming to shore. The shark went over and caught him. The Jewish man, he jumped off. And he went and he started swimming. And he was doing pretty good. He did a little bit better than the white man did. But the shark eventually caught him and he was done for. He said, then, then the black man, whose name was Shine, he said, Shine jumped in the water. And Shine started stroking. And that shark was on Shine's tail. But he couldn't catch Shine. So the shark said to Shine, he said, Shine, Shine. You're stroking fine, but if you miss one stroke, your black ass is mine. Your opponents have gotten you to stop swimming. Not, not, not to miss a stroke. They had, they have gotten us to stop swimming altogether. I'm here to tell you that none of the other races so-called races in this country can outrun you. All you have to do, black man and woman, is get into the race and don't be sidetracked by anything or anyone. And the race is yours. Don't worry. They, they are already tired. They've been running this thing for a while. We just been sitting back on the sideline. You got this. The white man, the Hispanics, the Indians, the Islanders, the Africans, all of them are relying on you not to get into the race. And by and by not racing, you become the prey. There are two types of, uh, I would say, ideologies in this country, in this society. There are two factors. And that is, you are either a consumer or you are the consumed. Up until now, Black people have been consumed. We go out and we just buy up everything, buy up everything. We're not producing anything. We just buy and buy and buy. That is the reality of capitalism, my dear people. That is called Economics 101. You're either the consumed or you're the consumer. We, up until this point, have not been acting in our best interest. Now there is a better system than capitalism, but we're not there yet. The other thing that I wanna share is that capitalism is a game. It is a game, but it's a game that is best played team-wise, as a team. Everybody else is coming together and we are out there trying to do our thing individually. You can't win. Because the team is constantly consuming. So we go out there, we'll get, we'll get money like our beloved brother Bill Cosby. We'll get money like 
the rest of the, the, the highly paid athletes, Mr. Bob Johnson, Barry Gordy, they all did that thing individually, but eventually the capitalistic system overshadowed them because they saw that, hey, we were making it as individuals, but our individual wealth could not compare to what they had built system systemically. Capitalism is a sport. There are rules. And if you don't play by the rules, you will lose. I don't matter. It doesn't matter how good you are as an individual. Individuals eventually get consumed. So you want to know why it is that we haven't made it as a people? is because we took the individual route. Mm -hmm. And everybody else is playing, playing a team sport. Right. And you have our, you have our crazy behind. Oh boy. Um, I don't want to talk, talk negative about our people. But you have our uh, leaders. And what I mean by leaders, I ain't just talking about somebody that's in politics. I'm talking about somebody that are teachers, that are lawyers, that are doctors. They are leaders. Mm -hmm. Whether they want to be or know it or not. There are 30 million people looking at them. And we have to realize that if we are going to win in this capitalistic society we got to play the game by the rules i don't care how i don't get, care how good of a football player you are if you get on a basketball court playing football rules you lose mm -hmm. and that's and that is the thing that we have to realize is that we have to first of all learn the rules of the game become proficient at the game but know that we've got to have a team no matter how good michael jordan were it wasn't until he started doing playing teamwork with the rest of the bulls that they became a force to be reckoned rec rec with mm -hmm. So if, I, if I do nothing else tonight, you mentioned it earlier, Brother Tali, we've got to come together. Because if we don't come together, we might just we might as well just go ahead and lay down somewhere. That's right. No doubt. We may as well lay down. And I'm telling you something, no matter what you think, individual success means nothing in this society. Right. Because most of us, we only make so much that we eventually will lose it all anyway. Most of our wealthy people died broke. Our comedians. I mean, even 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 right now, uh, I mean, I have lots of respect for Miss Oprah Winfrey. But she sold she sold her interest. In the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. Because she tried to do it alone. Right. She should have got together with, with, with other wealthy blacks and turned them on to it. Why, why get something and send it back to white folks? We can never, we can never, never accumulate wealth as a people thinking as individuals. I'm just, I, I mean, I would, I would love to say, but I'm telling you that is not according to the rules of capitalism. Because years ago they played that individual game. Now they all unite. 
I think it was Ronald Reagan back in the 80s. He broke up the monopoly that A&T had on the telephone industry. And in, do and in doing so, he changed the whole course of that game. Mm -hmm. It's important to know that we have to stop talking about black, I'm talking about black people, African-Americans, uh, Moors, uh, Hebrews, uh, Muslim, Christians, whatever the case may be, we got to stop looking for saviors. For someone to come save us, not going to happen. We have got to get in the game and save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you, if we get if we get into the game, we will win. There is no, there is nothing that can stop us. Because we won in the struggle in the womb. Now you would say, brother, brother, brother Omar, every human being on this earth have come through the womb. And I say. Yes, they have. But here's the important thing for us to know. And this is extremely important, Black people. None of those other societies has successfully come through the womb of society. None of them. They all gave up in the societal womb. The whites that came here from Europe, from England, from Britain, they flee their society. The Hispanics that come here, they flee their country. The Indians that come here, they flee their country. The Africans, they flee their country to come here. Mm -hmm. The Islanders, we love them so much, but they flew away from the island. They got out of there to come here. They gave up. They didn't, they, they didn't come out naturally in the womb of their society. We blacks, Negroes, indigenous ex-slaves, mm. uh, the, the new term they got, they have a term right now, Adolf. Mm -hmm. We never flew. We stuck it out here. We struggled, we fought, and we got the chance to impregnate the egg in the American society. And we are victorious over all of the treacherous activity in the vaginal womb, in the vaginal tract of the womb of the, of the female we have, we we have endured all of the hardship, all of the struggle in the womb of America. America is a womb. When we talk about don't we don't we say her? We don't say his America him. We say we say America her because it is a womb. Every society is a womb. And no dear people that we can stand up to the world as a shining example that we that we conquered 
the society of America. We are amongst the most educated people in this country when it comes to education. Well, I'm talking about education that they talk about in the school systems. We conquered that. We right now, indigenous ex-slave African-Americans, we spend over a trillion dollars a year. That trillion dollars is one third of, the, of, what, of what the whole continent of Africa mm. has, one third. So we haven't failed economically. We just got out of the race. <clears throat> what I'm doing is I'm trying to show us our strength. I'm trying to impart upon us that we are more that that we are more than just ex slaves. Every people that come to America, every last one of them, they come to us. Well, you know they want to come to us because they want to they want to make money off us. Yes, that mm -hmm. is true. That is true. But they also come to you and they learn. I remember uh, in the city that I was living in up in Jersey, there was a Chinese restaurant. The Chinese restaurant hired this brother, a black man, to work for them. And he went in there and he brought to their business, uh, you know, he was cooking uh, macaroni and cheese and pies and all of that type of stuff. You know what those Chinese did? They stood around him and watched him. And they learned what he was doing. When they, when they got his recipe, because he brought a lot of business to them, they fired him. Because we have more to offer than we think we do. We've been sold an idea that, hey, look at that black people, we ain't nothing. Hey, what was the thing? A nigga ain't nothing and never will be nothing. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is that everyone is watching us. The Koreans, the, the Spanish, they are all watching us. They are, they, they are uh, uh, mining our gold. They are mining our diamonds. Because we don't recognize our value. We, but we have accepted the idea that they are better than us. When in fact, they are learning from you. They are observing you. And they are stealing from you. Mm. I, think, I think back in the 60s and the 70s, all of those white guys over in Europe, in England, they were studying black music. Talk to the Rolling Stones. Talk to Mick Jagger and all those boys. They'll tell you we studied blacks mm -hmm. and hone and honed in on that energy, that wonderfulness that was in us. Mm. Otis Redding sang sitting on the dock of bay. Ain't got paid no money hardly. <laughs> but but simply red did. Mm. Elvis Presley studied black people. Mm -hmm. Colonel Sanders st studied black people. <laughs> we just not in the race, brothers. Right. Sisters. How many? How many black people have made major inventions, and the white people got credit for it? I'm talking about the specialness of you. Yes. And I'm not and I and I'm not pointing you to Africa. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not pointing you to anywhere but here. But I'm not pointing you to our slavery. Yes, we went through it, but that was a wound. Mm -hmm. We conquered it. But don't take anything I'm saying, because I'm not saying we're not due reparation. They owe us. But I'm all, but I am saying this, we should not sit back and wait for it because what will happen is that you would die off. Right now, right now, black people are saying, Well, I ain't had nothing to do with slavery. <laughs> That's the next generation. What's gonna happen when their children come up? We have to we have to stand up as a people in our victory. Because we are, whether we know it or not, we are a shining example to the world. Mm. Because all of them gave up, man. None of them fought the womb of the society that they lived in. Mm -hmm. And even when they came here, they ain't built the damn thing. We built it. Right. But they sell us on the idea that we are nothing. I was talking to, to, to uh, 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 my beloved brother last night. And I said to him, that um we have to realize as a matter of fact it's it, it really slipped my mind it'll come back it's like the sun, the sun rises and sets right it'll come back mm -hmm. we have to realize that we owe a debt. Black people, you, you and me, we owe a debt. What debt is it that we owe? We owe a debt to every one of our ancestors that came before us. Because had not they been in the womb fighting with fighting, we couldn't have won. All, all of those, all of those sperms that died in the vaginal tract, they were there as an aid to us to make us stronger and to be able to overcome the adversities that we are confronted with in society. They are our comrades. They are our ancestors. They are, they are our mentors. And we are here to receive the rewards that our fathers and ancestors didn't get. We can't fall asleep. This is our greatness that others have been stealing. And they steal it because we are unaware. What, what has happened? Let me let me let me share something with you. Don't you know that if you are out in the woods, out in the, out in the, out in the woods, and there and there and there are bears out there, and that bear is coming to you, your instinct jumps into fight or flight. While you are in the fight and fight mode, know that there's nothing cognitive going on. All of that falls asleep because it's got to, it has to get you away from danger. Mm -hmm. Don't let people frighten you, tell you, look, man, pardon my expression, but fuck what the, what the militias are doing. Mm -hmm. Oh man, they're gonna take, they're gonna, they're gonna do man, forget them guys. I worked with them years ago, 20 years ago. I worked with them. I taught them. They taught me too. 
it's a, it's a point in my life where I was riding around and I, I have read the Constitution and I'm saying, that, who, who are you to tell me I got to have a driver's license? <laughs> and I fought, I fought white America on that. Took them to court and won. Mm. Why did I win? I had the help of my, my, my patriot friends. Mm. I'm saying this is to, say, is to say to you this, is that you don't have to be afraid of the militia people. They have one aim in, 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 in mind, and that is to take back their government. Because the fact, the fact of the matter is their government have been hijacked. Yes. That's a fact. Now, once they get the government back, then you worry about them. <laughs> but they, they are racist. <laughs> but, right, but right now, you're not even an issue. You're not, you're not an issue to them. You don't have what they want. They have studied the Constitution and they believe that their country has been taken by big businesses and others. Mm -hmm. And that is a fact. But I'm saying, look, hey, look, man, I have no trouble. Hey, look, if you guys want to go down there and you want to take your, you want to take your yoke ain't my goddamn capital. I'm not benefiting from what from, from really what's going on in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. Them guys wanted that, that it took them 40 years to bring up the idea of reparation. The representative of New York, Mr. Kanye, he brought that up years ago. They wouldn't even bring it to the floor. Nope. I'm worried, I'm worried about them getting hurt. Kill them crackers. I don't care. But I'm, but I'm, I'm not, but I'm not blind to the fact when I work, when I work with the Patriots, I knew for a fact that they were racist. I knew how they felt about blacks. I knew how they felt about Jews. That's another issue. One day I'll talk about them. Mm -hmm. But they had something I wanted. I wanted to get get that cracker brother off my back. And they didn't just they didn't just uh tell me go here. No, they wrote my paperwork for me mm. that I can take into the court. And they didn't stop there, they came to court with me. Mm. I'm, I'm telling you, don't worry about those guys. Why do I say these things? Is because any time that they can get you in the fight or fight mode, your consciousness, your intellect goes to sleep. Hell, we're sleeping already because they've been have they've been they've been having us scared all alone. So therefore, we never think. Well, man, I'm woke. God bless you. You're woke. There was another saying. During the in the in the time of Muhammad of Arabia, he said the best of you is not the ones that are most woke. The best of you who is more useful to your society. Mm. We have our brothers and sisters. We're going out there and we're studying. We can wrap off everything about Africa. We can tell tell you about Timbuktu. We can tell you about Mali. We can tell you about the great kings and everything over there. We can tell you all of that. We can tell you how great Frederick Douglass were. We can tell you how great W.E. Du Bois were. But what are we doing today? Right. How useful is that knowledge? Oh, man, we got we to gotta know our history. Yes, you do. But I'm going to tell you something. 
you old ass black people need to be out doing some goddamn work. <laughs> Give that history to your children. They're the ones that don't know about it. They don't know about slavery. But just don't but don't just give them that knowledge. Give them that knowledge, but also look at them, study them, observe them and find out where is their interest? What is it that they are good at? And once you see that, then you encourage them. I didn't say make them. You encourage them to go after what they're good at. Because we, we should be about building a society today. And in our building our society today, we are now, we should be educating our young to be able to take over when you get old as my ass is. <laughs> right. I'm 69 years old. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on this planet. Yes, sir. We don't. But it ain't important. You know why? Because it was also stated that Muhammad won his fight in Arabia with old men and young children. Mm. So we get so we have so we have to get our young people involved. But the only way they're gonna get involved is that we are doing something. Is that we is that we are building something that they can fight for and, and, and that they can 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 prolong to a better state. The reason that the reason that I am telling you about how great and how good we are, that, my dear people, is a formula that was utilized in the Nation of Islam. I was a part of the Nation of Islam also. Elijah Muhammad didn't use uh, drugs to get black men and women off of drugs. He used self-esteem. Tell them how great they are. There are scientists that say and that if we could remember the pain that we endured in the womb of our mothers, it was enough. If we remembered it, it would kill us instantly. I say that to say the same thing about the pain that we endured as slaves. Mm. the pain that we endured as in Jim Crow. I was a part of Jim Crow. Yes, sir. I was too. I grew up in it. I'm walking down the street, a truckload of white hunkies riding on the back of a pickup truck with shotguns. They ran, they tried to run me over. Don't I know about Jim Crow. I don't have mm. nobody have to tell me about it. But my question to you, to all of my beloved, and believe me, I love you with every ounce of my being. My beloved black people, tell me, how is that going to make you do anything right now? Mm. It's like going out there, driving a car, looking in the rear view, rear view mirror. You still be going forward, but you're looking in the rear view mirror. What's going to happen? <laughs> you're going to run into something and have an accident and maybe kill yourself or somebody else. Get into the now. Because if we get into the now, is that now all of these all of these beloved brothers and, uh, and sisters, uh, the awake people, <laughs> what are they doing? They're talking about each other. Mm-hmm. They, they, they in a contest and they I'm smarter than you. I said, no, fool, you're blind, man. you got to hold to the elephant. And you're trying to describe something, but you don't see the whole picture. I'm going to stop there because maybe people have, have, have questions. I mean, I do. I, I, I would love, love to answer questions. Um, 
Not that I'm all that smart, but I, but I, I have experience. And if you are going to ever become anything in life as a people, you have to respect your older people. Mm. You have to you have to respect the wisdom that they have. And I'm going to tell you something else. Ain't nobody greater than anybody because they are Christian or Muslim or a uh, 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 Hebrew or uh, uh, Moors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You ain't better than nobody. And when you and when you realize that you can you can you can honestly embrace your brothers and sisters. And you can see what it is that they have to, that, that, that they have to teach you. When I was when I talked to Brother Tariq about about tonight, I said, I said, I said, I really don't want to come over and do no lecture. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to come on and answer questions. Because I may have questions for you and you got questions for me. We can learn from each other that way. And we can all better ourselves. If there's one thing that I said tonight that you can take and benefit your life from, by all means, take it. I'm not the author of anything. And I, and I go on the, on the uh, net and I watch all of you. Mm -hmm. because, because I know that you are very, very, very privileged and special people. Brother Tariq, I'm going to stop here. Okay, do Okay, do If there are any, any, any questions about anything that I said, uh, uh, any, any questions about black people at all, let's have a discussion. Brother Tariq, are you there? Yeah, um, I want to say this. Um, joining us tonight, uh, Brother Omar, we have uh, Brother Maurice Muhammad, yes, and sir. we have our wonderful sister, Courtney Omega. She joined us, and on speakerphone, we have uh, Brother Talib is on the speakerphone. It is my distinct, is my distinct honor to have all of you. Yeah, and I want and I wanted to apologize the last time that uh, that there was a gathering. I wasn't aware of it because my computer was down. So I apologize to y'all. Okay. Um, so we want to open up the floor for uh, questions and answers or just brief commentary. And everybody came in different. And Brother Muhammad was here uh, before everybody else. But of course, y'all know I'm a all black woman channel here. The sisters, you know, always get top priority. If Sister Omega want to send a shout out or say something real quick, uh, a question or a comment. I got to take my, my sister's go go first. Sister Omega, you, are you there? I am. I am here and absolutely enjoying the conversation. Uh, salute and, um, you know, hello everyone to the in the chat. I've been watching the stream and just listening and soaking up the knowledge. I do have a question. I'm going to pose it. I'm just going to drop my mic. You know how I do, brother. I, I'm going <laughs> <Yeah. my mic. laughs> to drop my mic after I drop this question. But let me um let me just share. You know, my again, much respect to the conversation that you just said uh, leading into this, brother Omar. When you said we have to live in the now, absolutely in a hundred percent agreement. Um, I do want to just pose this question to my brothers because this is, um, you know, I want to be very honest. You know, I'm very, um, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm very transparent with my, with my approach. Uh, I don't leave anything convoluted to my, uh, to, to, to uh, the, the, um, my, my conversation. So my question is this, I'm, um, I'm a divorced, you know, woman um, of eight years. I've been single and celibate for six years. Brothers, it has been really difficult for me, not even just to have, you know, not have found someone in these years, 
but also just to even engage in in these type of conversations with someone mm -hmm. personally, you know, physically, what I'm saying. It's easy for me to find brothers, you know, in these type of uh these type of atmospheres, which you know, it's kind of online, virtual, digital, what have you. But I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a um I'm a former elected official. I just uh, resigned from my position. I was the youngest councilwoman in Miami, Florida, Coconut Grove, and I moved back up here to Atlanta, Georgia. And it has been great as far as networking goes. But as far as you know, really finding that that type of Malcolm and, and Betty type situation, I tell you, it's been really something else. And and I'm sure you're you're both also aware, or not even just the both of you, but all of you are aware of what a challenged time we have right now when it does concern uh relationships between uh black men and black women and i you know i understand the media has done to influence it i understand what's happening to encourage that division but uh, brothers i just really want to know where where are these brothers at and you know so, where are these brothers at where are they hiding well, how can i network and meet with them and just build with them and you know another legacy minded brother um i i, I will say this like I said, networking wise, I'm finding them. But when it comes to brothers that are, you know, like I said, that, 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 you know, I want that. You mentioned Otis Red and he's one of my favorite, but I want, as Sam, the temptation said, I want the love I can see. Come on. I want that. <laughs> and I'm like, mm -hmm. where is that? Where is that? So I'm just wondering how can we, um, how can we start to engage in, in that conversation? Because as as someone put so eloquently there earlier, without unification, there is no liberation. So mm -hmm. I know that's what, you know, Brother Lee, you've said a number of times, and uh, that has been the consistent, um, the consistent tone of this conversation. But the unification starts there, Black man, Black woman. And, mm -hmm. you know, how can we start to have these conversations where, again, we're legacy minded, we are movement minded, and we are unification minded. So with that, I rest my mic. I thank you all again for just allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Thank you so, so much, brother, for the invite. And I'm going to listen. I'm putting myself on mute, but I am listening. Okay. Um, my suggestion always to whether it's male or female is I think I think uh, Michael Jackson put it best. That man, a woman in the mirror. You know, fall 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 in love with that person. Go in the go go in the bathroom. Look at yourself in the mirror, and have a love fest. You know, fall in love fall in love with how with with how great you are. You know, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, whether male or female, you know, is that, you know, this is the way I, I look at myself. And I was fortunately married for 37 years uh, before my wife passed on. And I had, um, I considered myself a diamond. And I, and, and I said to myself this, you don't find anybody walking around with diamond because there's a price to pay for diamond. Get to know you first. And then once then once you know you, you will attract to you that individual that is akin to you. I'm talking about a kindred spirit. The problem, the problem that, that most of us have in is that we focus too much on the physical. We focus on what a, what, a, what a man look like. We focus on what a woman look like, as opposed to getting in touch with that inward person. Like, right, right, right. Uh, uh, I remember one time I was on the, on the, on the uh, internet. I was, I, was, I was communicating with a sister. And she asked me to send her a picture. 
I said, I'm not sending you no picture. You haven't earned my picture yet. I want to get to know you, your mind. I want to get to know your spirit. And once I do that, then you have earned to get my picture. In other words, I just won't accept anything. I'm, a, I'm an extremely picky person when it comes to a female counterpart. And, 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 and um, my wife, God bless her soul, I asked her a question, right? Early on in our relationship, I, I asked her, I said, listen, I said, if you had the choice to choose between love and loyalty, which would you choose? My wife thought of my my wife thought about it and she said, I would choose loyalty. That told me something about her because I understood that there were that there are gonna be times when you're gonna love your mate, but there are gonna also come times when you can't stand their guts. <laughs> And the only thing that that will keep you together would be your commitment of loyalty to one another. Hmm. If you can, if if you can't find anyone like that, because you know the old saying is a love is a sensation that leads to temptation to increase the population of a future generation. Most of us don't know what love is. Mm. Most of us don't have an idea about choosing a mate. So I say my suggestion, and this is not to say, uh, Sister Omega, that you haven't done this. You know, but this is you, you put a question out there, and I'm asking it to the best of my ability. Hopefully, some of the other brothers would chime in. You know, so that we all can learn something from each other. Uh, you know, is that get to know you, know your worth, know your value, and don't take no wooden nickels. I mean, I applaud you for your uh, abstaining. You know, continue to abstain because most uh, most of the guys out here. Ain't looking for but just one thing. And they will tell you everything that you want to hear to be able to get into your pants. And once they get into your pants, they off to the next conquer. And you've got to be able to recognize that. A, 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 a man told me, say, look, look, if you're looking for a good man, why are you in a bar? Why are you thinking in a bar in the first place? Mm. He is there to find something he can conquer. And once he get it, he's off to the next one. So I, my, I, my suggestion is to you take a look at where you're looking for men at. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you something, Atlanta is a hot spot. Huh. You know, it, it is a hot spot, you know. Uh, and, and to my understanding, it ranked like number one in AIDS mm -hmm. in, in, in the country. Oh, I tell you, I don't look. I um, I do. What, uh, <laughs> I thank you, and I look. I do what Brother uh, Muhammad Ali said: treasures don't treasures are found. Treasures, right. they, you know, I'm very, you know, isolated. You know, I have my children. I'm homeschooling them. Um, okay. I write curriculum for other programs, so I'm very hidden, and and you know, I don't go out looking. But it's just the fact that, um, like, I can tell you five years ago, I used to be able to bump into, you know, <laughs> whether I was at the gym or, you know, it just seems like I would bump into people. But, like, it's been, in the past two years, it, it hasn't been that. It's been really interesting. It hasn't been that. It hasn't been that type of interaction. And even when I was um, on the dais, you know, as a councilwoman, uh -huh. the other councilmen that I was, that I was you know, meeting, we just weren't really on, you know, the same page, but you're absolutely correct. You have 
to, you know, love yourself first. And it is something that I teach. I have a daughter and a son, or as I like to call it, call them a diamond and a son. And that's exactly what I tell them as well. You know, the, 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 the more that they know and love who they are, the easier it will be to appeal. But like I said, I take what Muhammad Ali said, a, a diamond don't have to go looking to be found. You know, right. a diamond is a diamond. People go searching for it. And also what it says is that, um, you know, um, a man who findeth a wife findeth a good thing. So, but I thank you. And I absolutely, I, 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 I do, I do know that, uh, that's, that's quintessential and that's key. And, you know, I've had great conversations with my dad in this regard as well. I am blessed to still, you know, have him on this earth that we can talk. But um, it just seems like I said, I, I would be able to bump into guys a few years ago and, you know, go get a cup of coffee or, you know, go right. to the go to the bookstore and share some conversation, at least like even if it was, didn't amount to it, didn't it, it didn't uh, transition into some type of relationship. It was still good conversation. We still built, you know, a, a nice rapport with one another. But mm -hmm. these last few years have really been something else. I was just like. It's like God just totally, you know, put, I said, my husband must gonna be real mighty because God want to make sure ain't nobody touching me. <laughs> I'm not getting any type of interaction with no other men. So it's, it's been really something. I'm meeting some very quality sisters, though. I will tell you that some real great sisters, but a guy ain't sending no men my way to have any type of conversation. So it's really, uh, you know, friends, definitely, you know, brothers. Very powerful brothers that are really committed to the movement. Um, very, uh, very aware of the the shift. Like you said, you know, brothers that are not sitting around talking about, oh, what are we going to do about this capital situation? But brothers that are committed to building our own militia. So it's been incredible in that regards. But um, yeah, yeah, the 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 relationship talk has has been really uh, non-existent, non-existent. So. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back on silent again because um I, I know we have some other uh some other topics to move on to. We don't have to call this up. This is not gonna be Courtney's reality love show. <laughs> but I thank you so much. I do. No, thank you. All right then. We, we want to pass the mic to our to our brother uh Maurice Mohammed. Brother Maurice, you there? Uh yes, sir, dear brother. I'm here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um be before I ask our elder a question, I do want to give um, Sister Courtney um, what I what I think. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm very proud of you. I've been following you um, and listening to what you're saying in the background, um, and I, I'm I'm happy to see. And to uh, come in to know who you are and what you are about, and I applaud you for doing the work that you do and living the life that you live. Mm -hmm. Know that um, you're special. Not you're you're very special, and raising your children that way very special. Um, for you to have the the right kind of um, man, you have to be in that environment, right? So for like my organization, B1, we have classes where our men go to and we're developing the women classes. We have training for our children to go up. We got the manhood training classes um, because we know that in order for us to be successful, the family unit must be rebuilt and must be strong. And um, there are, there we do have single men in B1. And we definitely um, look for single women to join who know that they're ready for to have a family unit. Um, but, you know, you got to make sure everything is straight because with us, the way we go, you know, there's an imposed discipline that we all fall up under because we know that this way is what's right for our people in order for us to birth a new reality. We can go and take over a city, but if we go with the same nigga mindset or cracker mindset, producing nothing new, it's the same old thing, just in a black face. Right? Yeah. So we believe in that 
our minds have to be totally renewed, you know, and it can't be renewed in the old way. It definitely have to be renewed, higher knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and our ability, our ability to live it, not just talk it, not just teach it, but to live it. So, um, you know, I would definitely, I, I, I know a few brothers um, that are single, um, but again, they're moving to Mississippi. So if you're interested in coming to Mississippi, I have a few brothers that I know would be definitely interested in having a good conversation with you. And um, uh, to our elder, my, my question to you, dear brother, is we know that Allah says in the Quran that um, old men for counsel and young men for war. And when we move into Mississippi, that's that's war. There ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about it because we're taking power. We ain't begging. We're taking it. So what advice could you give us as we prepare for battle? And that's my question to our elder. I would uh, suggest that we take a look at at, at uh, whether or not now is the time to deal with uh, the battle mindset, you know, because when you when you when when we when we're in battle, we're not really building; we're tearing down, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so, I would suggest humbly that we work on building, you know. Um, and then, and then, and then once we build, we only go in battle if someone tried to take that which we build. You know, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a former member of the Nation of Islam, I mean, we like, we like martial arts, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but the, uh, the focus was on defense, you know, and not and not on on offense because the uh, the the honorable Elijah Muhammad he 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 said to us, and this is something that he said at the end of every temple meeting. He said, "We are not to be the aggressor." You know, is that. In fact, he, 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 he really encouraged the FOI, don't even carry so much as a pen knife, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because his focus was on building, you know, and then, and, then, and, 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 then, and what happens is that now we learn martial arts every, every, every Saturday, but it was, it was but it was, but the, the overall focus was on building, you know, and I mean, even even I were going into Mississippi. We want to go into Mississippi and build. And we will fight with no one unless they fight with us. You know, and uh, I mean, that, that I think I think that to answer to answer your question, you know, you know, I'm, I'm basically talking about from a focus point of view. Now, now I understand the concept of the mindset. The fact that, hey, look, at, is that uh, I were going out to reclaim our own or to build our own. That 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 in itself is war. I suggest that it is not war. I suggest that that is a concept or a mindset of building, and, and because if we if we focus on building. We are going to be amazed at what we accomplished because because there is a different mindset for war and building because war again we are activating 
our reticular brain, the fight and flight. That's why the army or the military have generals and captains and things who, who aren't in the thick of the war to sit down and think and strategize on what to do and how to do and where to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is, that, that is, that is my suggestion. What do you think about that, Brother Muhammad? Oh, he dropped. Oh, he dropped? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, he dropped for some reason. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully he heard oh, you. He, he heard you. Back. He'll be back. Here, okay. Back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I understand. I understand what you're saying. Um, but I'm, I'm more talking about when I say, um, you know, we're going to war, even because we got to run for office and we got to win. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what is what is the guidance? What kind of guidance that you can give? Um, you know, a, a lot of it is sitting back and, and planning. And, and we've been doing that. We have an, a very aggressive 100 day, our first 100 day agenda. Um, right. But yet we know that there will be, you know, traps or pitfalls because, you know, we're, we're going to go up against an enemy. OK, let me ask you so, this question. Mm -hmm. OK, when are you planning on embarking upon this task? Um, we will be I will be there. My family will be there in February. February, uh, okay. February, yes, we'll be that'll be our permanent residence in February. We'll make it that. Okay, super. Um, now, uh, I was listening uh, one day to um, uh, Alexander, uh, uh, what is it? Not Alexander, uh, Acosta, the Ocasio lady, the senator from New York. Mm -hmm. And she actually uh, was. Uh, she did like uh, ran against an incumbent who was very, very powerful in the in, in, within the state of New York, and as a matter of fact, within the country itself. And she basically just went out there and hit the street. And then, and then what she said is that they learned as they went, because you could, because until you are out there, you're really not going to know what's confronted with. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, yes, I would say go out there, hit the street, get to know the people, introduce yourself to them, and go from there. What I would, what I would, what I would. Um, now, are you planning on in your going? Are you planning on joining a particular party? Are you running as an independent? Uh, exactly how are you planning on doing that? Yes, we're 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 running as an as an independent. We have our own party, the uh, B one party. Okay. Um, and so we're getting that registered in Mississippi and we're going to push that out to uh, other states as well. But yes, it's our own party, B1. Mm -hmm. okay. I just 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 understand that you have two ex two existing machines already there. OK, and. Um, people are already orientated uh, in Republican and Democrat, you know, and. Uh, and and the uh, to 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 run as an independent, okay. The the your, the cards are really stacked against you. So what you what you um uh, what you what you might want to do is is find out, you know, can you find like minds in the existing parties that are there, and can you establish a a rapport or relationship with them, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it depends on how fast you want to do it, mm -hmm. you know. Now, uh, the the town or the, the the city that you're going to, what's the population? Are you having any idea? Uh, sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred. Yes, sir. Sixteen hundred. Yes, sir. Sixteen hundred. Okay. That's our first city. Okay. How many blacks are there? Um, there are thirteen hundred blacks. Oh, okay. You shouldn't have no problem. Just go to. <laughs> <laughs> just go, go, yeah, just go, go there and uh, court. Yeah, court the blacks, you know, because I mean, if if they, I mean if 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 they are, man, that's an overwhelming amount of black people in a city. Mm -hmm. You know, 
So go, go in there. I, now, what I would suggest is this. Is when you when, at going in there, uh, seeking to become a, a leader in that community. You can't go in there hardcore Muslim. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you can't go in there worrying about uh, people's moral. Uh, because you're not going to win them that way. You know, you you have to you have to you have to go in there, and uh, basically figure out how can you add to the betterment of their of their community. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you definitely. I mean, I mean, you. I mean, you can't. You cannot be brother Muhammad because you are brother Maurice Muhammad. You know, but we are. Mm -hmm. But Muslims are accepted in 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 the in the community now. But the but, but what you what you what you what I would suggest you do is you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna go in there because I'm not I'm not going in there at, uh, to set up a religious institution I'm going in there to deal in a political game and you got you you have to know how that game and what are the rules to that game and how can you be most effective in getting your campaign across because because the reality is your religious your your religious upbringing your religious thing that's your thing religion is a personal thing mm -hmm. you know and then and then you have to uh like what what they did and what the what the, the muslim community did in africa is that they went in as businessmen and they were able to to convert those people over to their ideology because of the uh, because of the uniqueness of their of their business savvy, you know. So find find you figure you figure out what is it that that I mean what let uh, what I, let me not assume what is your strategy in dealing with the people of that city. Well, we had uh, well basically our strategy is to come in there. And, um, you know, go door to door, getting to know them and letting them know exactly what B1 is and what our political um, and social platform is um, and show how they live in a, a, a totally black town, uh -huh. but yet they don't even have their own grocery store. They don't have there's a lot of things they don't have. And they've been living like this since forever, you know, and it's now it's time for new leadership. You know, they go complain about, you know, we can't get this, we can't get this, we can't get that. Well, we want to come and show them exactly what real leadership is and take charge and just make it happen. You know, like I said, we have a very aggressive um, action plan for our first 100 days in office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I've said before, on day one, you know, as an example, everybody in the police department going to lose their jobs because they're not. Their mentality is not a black first mentality. So we will replace them with black first um, people. Now, we'll also have an orientation so that they can come and learn what is black first? What is that mentality? Um, what is that way? And it's not uh, black first is not a religion. So oh, really? it is, we're not dealing with any religion. We're, we're just dealing from what is right, what is moral, and, and what is just, and how do we, you know, live productive lives. So we're, we're really, we're taking power and really just turning it in a way that even for the white folks that do live in that city, because mm -hmm. we've, we've been, I've been asked this question by a few of them when we were there before, you right. know, does that mean because you coming in and you're going to bring your black first ideology, does that mean that my life is in danger? And my answer to them is no, it doesn't mean your life is in danger. It means by you living in this city, you're going to experience uh, justice, true justice for the first time in your life. You're going to experience true freedom for the first time in your life. That's what it is. We're, we, we are about living the principles that we believe in living the principles that that we teach and with this this way of life we believe we believe that given power once you take power now you have the power and the right to redirect education to redirect the social order and you know we, we plan on doing these things 
I, what I would what I would suggest is that uh, let me ask you this: Have you have you thought what it is that they want? When we did a um, we did a tour through Mississippi, and we visited over ten cities and towns and talked to everybody and and told them what we're bringing in. And everybody from the business leaders to the regular common everyday black man and woman on the street to the teenagers to our elders, they all agreed. And because what we, we based our platform off of, what are the things that we need to have in order to have a prosperous life? What yes. is the environment that we need to create? And so once we figured that out, we use that as a template because we all want freedom, justice, and equality. So since we all want these things, you know, and everywhere that we went bringing, letting them see this is what can happen. You know, they were saying, well, use this city as, as your first city. Do it this here first. Do this here first. Um, and then we've had other cities that actually reached out and said, you know, hey, I need you to come this way so, you know, we can understand what you're bringing. Right. Um, so I, I, it, it's something that all, all of us need, you know, and it will be that proper environment where people will truly get to know one another and truly get to understand what it means to be, you know, somebody's neighbor. You know, as it, as it says that it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to abuse a child. So, you know, we want to make sure that we be exactly who it is that we be. And, you know, we can make these things be more than just some words written on a paper. Right. We can bring it to life and make it an actual fact. OK. Uh, and I say, I mean, it's, it's uh, seeing that you've done your research, you know, and um, I would suggest to. Um, to move forward, see how it, see how it works, you know, and if you if you have to make adjustments then make adjustments, mm -hmm. don't. You know, don't just I mean, I mean, don't go. Just don't go in callous. It's going to be my way or the highway because it, because it's going to probably be the highway. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, you know, so uh, that's that's what I that's what I would suggest, you know, is that uh, don't go in too hard. Mm -hmm. OK, you know, ease, ease, ease in. Get the people to get to know, get the people, get the people to know you and you know them. Mm -hmm. And bring about an eventual change, because going going down in Mississippi, uh, you're gonna you're gonna find that uh, I mean black people there, you know I don't know I don't know what your dietary uh, practices are, okay, but they got their own way of doing of doing of doing things, you know, and uh, and and you can uh, I say I say go ahead on because hey it's I would rather see you doing then see you sitting back waiting, you know, go ahead, go, go ahead and get involved get, because what's going to happen is that when you go there and you really start, I mean, to, to sit down and have a conversation with somebody is one thing, you know, but to get them to pull that lever, hmm. you know, it's going to be a whole thing altogether. So you need to, you need to get, you need to find out what is it that you have to do to get in. And then once you get in, you can start making the necessary changes that has to be made. But whatever, whatever, whatever you promise them, they've got to see that your word is bound. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you know, and pe and pe people don't people don't uh, care what you want. You know, they care about what it is that, that what is it that they want, and if you can show them. How to get what they want? They will love you. It's, I mean, when you when you're going into 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 a, a community, it's mm -hmm. like it's like getting involved with a with a woman or with a wife. Mm -hmm. You got you got to court them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You know, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. because because they, because if you go in there, well, look, I want this and I want that and I want this and I want they they, they say who gives a fuck what you want. You know, that's 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 gonna be that will be their mindset. I mean, I mean why are you there in front of them? Mm -hmm. But when they but when they go in that in, into that uh, voting booth, 
you can't you you're not in front of them. They don't have to they don't have to say what they think you want to what what you think what they think you want to hear. They're gonna pull a lever in their interest. Yes, sir. You know, so to to I mean it's uh I said but but go ahead, go ahead and make and make that move because I'm gonna tell you. Starting out, the prospects are darn good. Thirteen hundred as opposed to three hundred. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. you, know, I mean, you got something going for you there, you know. But you, but you, but you got, but you got to know. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, Sister uh, Omega. She's looking for a husband, but she ain't gonna just accept anybody, you know. If right. A, if, if a if a guy come in her life and, and she say, oh, hey, this, hey, look, hey, this guy is too overpowering. She's probably going to take a step back, you know, and, and say, mm -hmm. okay, can, 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 can we work something out here to where, where that we both get some of what we want? Because a good negotiation is never one individual getting everything they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know? Yes, sir. So, so that, that is my suggestion. But again, I mean, you got, you got your thing already in motion. Make 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 it happen. And uh, what now? You said what part of uh, Mississippi is that? Uh, Cold Water, Mississippi. Cold Water. Okay, because I'm, I'm right next. I'm, I'm right next door in Louisiana. Mm, okay. Okay. You know, and uh, you know, I can come come down there and, and, and assist in the kind of way I can. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. You know? Well, we definitely can use you. Yes, sir. Definitely. So. Uh, um, I can I can give you my phone number. Okay. You know, um, in fact, uh, it is uh, three one eight. You got a pen? Yes, sir. I did send wife Muhammad. Uh, I sent that his information to you to your email, brother uh, Maurice. Oh, know. you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah, cause I cause wife Muhammad asked about it about him the first on Soul Liberation Day. Right. Mm -hmm. I asked him. If it was all right for me to share his information with everybody, and I sent the information to everybody. Okay. So, okay. so okay. it's still an email. If not, I'll resend it to you, uh, Brother Muhammad. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, if you send it to wife, I'm quite sure she got it. So yeah. I'll just get it. Mm -hmm. Any, anything I can do to assist, just um, I'm, 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 I am uh, willing and able. And yes, sir. Mississippi is just a skip and a hop away. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Elder. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, our brother Talib. He had a question for the elder also. Brother Talib, you still there? Yes, I am, brother. Thanks for uh, being patient and holding. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, brother uh, Omar, uh, yes, sir. I'm glad to have been on this panel tonight to hear you speak and um my question is to you brother is what would your direct advice be to our younger generations right now coming behind us knowing what you had to deal with during the jim crow segregation era right and uh what would your advice be to them as to how to deal with this current Caucasian population in this country today toward, um, you know, the goal of taking separation very seriously. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because our people are uh, unfortunately caught up in this, uh, you know, mystery fantasy that America is nothing like it was during the time that you can him up in Jim Crow. So can you expand on that furthermore, brother? So uh, that yeah. you know, yes. Especially with the possibility of children listening. Well my my suggestion would be would, would always be to uh number one this ain't our fight. You know, let 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 these white people deal with deal with white people. That's where their focus is. You know, uh, you know, this this ain't our fight. You know, and when, when we realize that, 
you know, we should be about building now because what, what happened is your, your, your enemy's attention is elsewhere. I was talking, I think I was talking to you, you know, I said, look, hey, I, I would suggest that they all carry a, 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 a little small American flag in their pocket. <laughs> and if and if they if, and if they approach pull that flag, I'd start hollering, hollering, hey, hey, ups to America, you know, up to the Constitution. That's what that's that's where those people head is. You know, you know, you know they're not they're not they're not worried about black people right now. Not not even in the least little bit. As a matter as a matter of fact, they uh black they are black people that are working amongst them. Because they what they are putting is the constitution. That's what they're talking about. You know, I mean, uh they may not be aware of the fact that the constitution is a document that belongs to a corporation. I remember one time I I, I was living in the city and I, I own a property there and they had the code inspectors that go around the people houses and walk into their backyards and doing their inspection thing. You know, and they gave and they and uh they gave me a ticket and I went to court and I put together a document, you know, that hey, I was I was in the city of Plainfield, New Jersey. And my thing to the court and to those people was this. Hey, look. I really don't care what the rules of Plainfield, New Jersey is. I'm not, I'm not a part of that corporation. I said, it's just like me worrying about what, what happens in AT&T. AT&T is a corporation. The United States of America is a corporation. You know, and, 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 and we have to realize that. If, they look, if, that now if, if there is no nexus that ties me to you, I could care less what happened in your corporation. Those laws only is 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 is, uh, is 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 aimed at the people that are part of that corporation. You know, and I would what I what I would say to what I would say to the uh, to the young people is that figure out what you want in life, what you want to do in life. And when you figure out what you want to do in life, pursue that. And don't be and don't be sidetracked. But I would also say to them, whatever, whatever that is, whatever it is that you get involved, that you pursue, make sure that there's a future in it. Because we have we have black people, man. We have like I, I mentioned in, in, in the uh, in the, uh, the talk, we have degrees upon top of degrees upon top of degrees. But are they benefiting us? Mm. That that meant that we went out and got a degree in a dying field. Find out where society is going, and then choose your degree or your 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 scholarship in that, so that you so that you'll have a so that you'll have some type of future. You don't go to school to get become thousands of dollars in debt and get out of school and can't find a job. Because that job is no longer relevant in society. So that's what I would tell. That's what I would tell the young people. You know, is that you should you should be, you should be sitting down thinking about your future today. And that and that and that's going to be something that their parents are going to have to do. You know, I mean, why would why would I go out there and get uh, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 thousand dollars in debt? And this and this and this kid ain't going to be able to find a job when they finish school. You know, you got you got black people that go that go to school and they're taking up African-American history. Tell me, please, how are you going to take care of your family doing that? Mm. Wow. Because if a if a university don't hire you, you ain't got no work. Mm -hmm. But a whole lot, right. but a whole lot of our people do that. 
just to say I've been to school. <laughs> right. And we have to, and another thing we have to realize is that society is making it harder and harder for people to get um, a, a basic education. And, and and really, really be able to take care of themselves. Because the because the whole the whole point is that remember I was saying is that you're either consuming or you're being consumed. Hmm. We have to make sure that what whatever direction that we take, we are putting ourselves in a power position. It's not. It's not. It's not enough because I think the like I, like I said to Brother Tariq, I think that this idea and and now Brother, brother uh, Mar, uh, Muhammad is that the idea of moving to one of these southern states is a profound idea. Why is it? Why is it? Why is it so profound? Because it's cheaper. Hmm. I bought I bought my house I bought my house and I pay six hundred dollars less than six hundred dollars a year in taxes I paid cash for my house and if I wanted the homestead I'd be paying less than three hundred dollars a year in property taxes when I lived in New Jersey I was paying eight thousand dollars a year in property tax. <laughs> We need to get out of those. Out of, well, listen, we're getting out of them one way or another because they're gentrifying everywhere. And they're just pushing blacks away, pushing us away. We're going to end we're going to end up down south, whether we want to or not, because we can't afford it. Not to cut you off, brother, but that was going to be my second question. So, okay. so uh, my thing is, is that at this point, the only option we have is to migrate back to the south altogether, basically. At the point, because of the fact that, like you said, we're being gentrified and removed and from different communities and other parts of the country, and then also uh, my question is as far as the south being concerned, is that uh, should we also um, uh well, I know your your answer may be yes to this question, but should we take over all the industries that our ancestors uh, were used through free labor to build this country with? Well, like we, the cotton, the sugar cane, should we take advantage of all that? Because, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we made other people rich off of that, so... I mean, it's it's our turn to make ourselves economically stable off of that, to be able to take, while we're taking control politically of a state, where then we can flourish, and from there, my question would be, would it help us then to grow into a society of our own at that point? Well, what, I, what we need to do, what I would suggest, is we need to uh, do uh, a thorough investigation on whether or not uh, to get involved in cotton is feasible. To get in, to get to, to take a look and investigate whether to get involved involved in soybeans is feasible. Whether getting involved in corn is feasible. You know, I mean, it's one is one thing to uh, to get involved with it. Do you have a market? Have you can you establish a market for it? I think I think that uh, black people we should definitely get into farming because we need to feed ourselves. Because the bottom line, you can be the 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 the, the, the most ferocious revolutionary in the world if you're hungry. What good are you? Mm. You know, so we have to, we have to, we have to make decisions like that. 
is that is it is it is is it feasible for us to do this? Now, now we we have we do have as black people already marketable markets for our talents. We have to we have to figure how we can get it, how we can get control. Now, one of the things that um Don King did in boxing. Don King tried to enter enter into boxing, and Aaron Aaron uh Bob Aaron and them guys blocked him out. So what Don King did was Don King went and got involved with the up and coming boxers. And that's how he built his boxing uh, career. Business, rather, well, wasn't a career, business. And then he lucked, he lucked up and, uh, I mean, in other words, you find a niche. You find something, a niche that you can visit. That's just one-on-one business. Find a niche, feel that niche, and you make money. It's just that simple. You know, now when you when you talk about getting into the into the farming industry, we we have to understand that the government is not pushing Americans to farm. In fact, they pay them not to. So we have to ask ourselves, other than feeding ourselves and supplying our own food as a people, how feasible is it? It might be feasible, it might not be. Now I do I do know this is that the uh living in New Jersey, they had the Pennsylvania Dutch people down in Pennsylvania. Yeah. These these guys ride around every day in in, in wagons, horse and wagons. But they have the one of the most lucrative dairy business in the country. Find something where you can get a niche at and work it. But it, but all of that takes investigation. We as black people have to get away from making emotional decisions. Mm -hmm. We have to we have to sit down like any scientist does and scientifically investigate and look into the feasibility of pursuing that particular thing like we have many many markets that we can take over i mean right now man who is the who is the boss on the basketball court who is the boss on the football field what's wrong with black people starting their own football and basketball industry We have all the talent. Well, then these people are used to getting paid a th uh, millions of dollars a year. We have to we have to work on that. I mean, it's not difficult to to raise a million dollars. Especially if you have a, 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 a group of people. I mean, the people out there went out there in uh, in Georgia. And they um, bought what they bought, 96 acres. <clears throat> so that means that now that, that there are families coming together and they're building on that 96 acres. But they ain't just go out there and start building. They went down there and they and they began to do research. How are they going to establish the infrastructure? And they're setting all of that stuff up. Like I say, man, there is a price to pay for everything, and one of the, and one of the number one pr prices to pay is we have to investigate. We have to create our own black intelligentsia, and we have to study different people, like they study us. And that's that, and that's what I was suggesting to Brother Muhammad. Study, study that town. I mean, it's, 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 it's good that you got the, the, the population thing that you have there. But study that town. Find out, 
find out what it is. And then you got to also uh, look at uh, whether or not uh, who, who controls the sewage, who controls the water. Would it be would it be better to go to go into that town with uh, gas? Or should, or should you have solar systems? There are all kind. There are all kind of things to consider. How you can make it better for the people that's there. Then get in touch with somebody with the solar. Hey, what would what would it cost? to solarize the whole cotton picking town. And when you and, and when you do that, now the people can, can pull together and now they can buy their energy from you. Now you create you have created your own energy company. Yes sir. That's that's excellent right there. <laughs> Most definitely. You know, it's, I mean, it's, 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 there's a, there's a lot to it, but it's doable. And when you got and when you got people with you, it is it becomes super doable. How many of those thirteen those thirteen hundred people are employed? Do you need to find a way to? Get in touch with companies to be able to bring jobs there. That's got to be number one in any black community. Until you until you are able to build your own jobs. I'm sorry. Did that did I answer your question, brother? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Most definitely, Elder. Thanks a lot. All right. And, and one more thing I just want to say as a commentary is that uh, I am grateful to hear that we have inspired Brother Maurice Muhammad to embark on the path that he is on mm -hmm. right now to Mississippi. Yeah. I'm glad that our ideal has inspired him. Yeah. The mission of fight is, is to take control of that whole state. So that we could be once and for all liberated as a people. Yeah, we should. 400 years of bondage, servitude. Yeah. And uh, thanks for everyone for listening to my question to our elder. And thanks, elder, for answering my question. Thank you. And I pass the mic on. Thank you for asking. All righty then. All righty then. Guess it. Guess the mic comes back to me. I uh, cause uh, two hours and a half. Oh, has been that long? Done, done pretty good, pretty well. I want to just give my little two cents in real quick. Just two cents. Just, just two cents. We, we all, we'll all, we we'll all accept the penny. I'm <laughs> 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 just kidding. Um. Sister Omega, I guess she had to go. And uh, I don't do male-female relationships that love stuff. I don't, <laughs> I leave that up to you, brothers. I don't, I don't, I don't never even talk about it. I don't bring about it. My philosophy is you 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 build a better human being, and, and that'll get better in and of itself. You don't have to worry about it too, too, too much. It'll it'll all fall in place. You know, our problem right now is we just messed up human beings, you know. As far as, you know, we got a lot of demons. A lot of us are carrying some demons. A lot of us have been molested as children. A lot of us are, uh, are, are drug addicts still trying to handle that type of problem. We we don't, we have temper problems. We can't handle temper. We have a lot of problems here. And then you talk about, I'm falling in love. You bringing all this stuff with you to the relationship. So, you know, build a better human being. And those things will begin to iron themselves out. Um, I love the conversation. And, uh, and a lot of the things that has been said is what uh, Operation Exodus Mississippi, the Mississippi Initiative, all that, that's what it's all about. I remember, and I think I shared this with Brother Maurice when I first done it, 
uh, I made the, the, the uh, DVD and I took it to the post office and there's nothing but soul brothers and sisters in the post office. And I went to mail the DVD, return receipt, and pay for that. And the brother took the DVD and just so, just so happened, he saw that I was sending it to Minister Louis Farrakhan. And he looked at me, looked at the package, looked at me. I'm like, what? You know, why, why is he doing that? He said, this going to, to the minister? I said, I said, yeah. And he's like, bro, I, I, I'm just curious. What is it? <laughs> you know? You know, he, you know, so I'm like, and I explained to him that it's a DVD. I'm introducing to the minister uh, this idea called the Mississippi campaign. And I explained to him and other brothers and sisters that was working at the post office came out and to, to listen to what I had to say and explain it. And they was fired up. They was like, man, I hope the minister get on board. It's a great idea. And it is a great idea if you really think about it you were saying something to the fact brother omar find your niche and then in, in a market and i suggested that we specialize in organic food okay. we can grow a little corn a little wheat whatever but we want to specialize in organic food there's a big there's a big market folks want this organic stuff so all around the world, not just in America, but around the world. And, and you can, uh, you feed yourself, your people, good food, plus you're able to, to make a living off of it because you need people to be the farmers. You're going to need people to keep the records. It's a, you're making jobs for your people. Right. Also, the Mississippi campaign, the way it's set up, it's not about it. It's not just an adult thing. You want to focus on the farming or anything. You want to be able to bring our little children. I told, I was telling people, bring your little babies and they can barely walk. Put a seed in their hand. Take a picture of them putting the seed in the ground. So in the future, when they get old and we might be dead and gone, whoever, they, you can tell that child, you help make Mississippi. You help us take control of the South. When you was putting that seed in the ground, when you was a baby, you help us become the great nation that we become. But that's all down. We we who live today, we are the ones to put the seed in the ground. We're the ones to plow. We probably won't be around to see the corn when it comes up, things of this nature. You shouldn't even have to worry about that. That's our, that's our job. And then you guide the future generations to tell them, if you want to keep this, this is how you maintain. And this is how you keep. And this is how you grow, this is how you evolve. So, and you was talking about how unique our we are as a people. That's why I don't understand. When I choose to call us soul brothers and sisters, and you come from a, the same place, because I'm pretty sure, Brother Omar, you grew up in the same type of atmosphere, because I grew up when we was we were soul brothers and sisters. You remember when we used to get that doubt, you know. That little dap thing and, and the different shaking the hand. And when I was a little boy, uh, a grown man would come to me off the street and he said, Hey, little brother, give me five on the black hand side in the hole. You got soul. You remember them kind of that's ours. That's our uniqueness. You ain't gonna find that no nowhere else. I won't mind. I don't mind being an African. I don't mind being a Hebrew Israelite. I don't mind being none of that stuff, but I want mine. I want something unique to me. That's just mine. Nobody else can claim it. I don't want to share. I'm greedy when it's mm. after this. I'm greedy. I don't want to share this with you. You know, so, so when they get that organic food and we put our uh, uh, label on it, whatever, they say, it's got to come from Mississippi. This got to come from Alabama. This got to come from because our stuff going to be good. That's what we're known for. Growing good organic food, organic milk, organic beef, organic chicken. And hey, they still eat pork. Hey, still eat pork. I, I don't eat pork, but hey, our people still eat it. But it's a slow process of things. And see, just like you were saying earlier, Brother Omar, you know, it's, it's an easing, slowly evolving people into different things. You're not forcing nothing on nobody. 
You let them make the decision. Cause I had a, I had a, a girlfriend. I was a Muslim and she was a Christian. And I told her how I felt about pork and no big deal. You know, she was eating her pork. I was eating my, eating my, uh, whatever I was eating. But one day out of the blue, I came home and, uh, cause we was living together. I came home and looked in the refrigerator. All the pork was gone. I'm like, what? I'm looking I'm like, which I'm happy about it. But I'm like, all the pork is gone. And she said, don't you, don't, don't you think you caused me to do that? I did it on my own. You know, I said, I didn't say nothing. I didn't even, you know, it was all, I'm happy, you know, really about the whole deal. But see, let people do things on their own accord. We got this thing about trying to force things on somebody. And you shouldn't want to do that because when you force things on somebody, it's not real. They're doing it out of fear. They're doing it because they got bullied. They're not doing it out of the sincerity of their heart. And that's what I'm looking for. Because when people do th these things, they're not doing it because, oh, God is going to punish me and and because uh, you're going to shoot me in the face. No, they're doing it because this is what I think is good for me, what benefits me. They're not being forced because I know I don't want to be forced to do nothing. I'm sick of that. We've been forced to do things for over 300 years. I'm sick of people forcing stuff on me. Oh, you got to do this and you got to do that. You better. Well, just kill me. Kill me and get it over with. I'm, not going, I'm tired of people bullying me around and trying to tell me what to do. I need to believe this. I need to do that. You No, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead. I'm not. You, you should be sick of somebody trying to bully you and forcing you and using fear tactics and things of this nature to tell you what to do. Look, we are supposed to be free. I don't need no more slave masters. I had enough of the peck of wood. I don't need you to be my slave master. I'm not doing that. But uh, on that note, like Cara Burnett used to say on her show, uh, uh, yeah, what's that little song she said? Uh, I, get, I enjoy our little time together. Just a singer, you know that, that little song. Thank you, brother Maurice. I would definitely, I'm, I'm looking forward to being on your program Tuesday, and joining you brothers and sisters on your program Tuesday. I thank yes, you, sir. Uh, Sister Omega, for joining, and of course, and brother Talib on the speakerphone. Unfortunately, Sister Noble couldn't make it uh, tonight. And uh, matter of fact, let me let me share her share that her uh, book information with us before we get out of here. Share that. I'm so happy for those who have supported our sister Nova, her book called uh, God is on Trial, How Religion Keeps Humanity Under Mind Control and Fear. So once again, I thank Brother Maurice for joining us tonight and sister uh omega courtney and of course our special guest and hopefully he'll come back and do give us a little bit of something something i think tonight was really really nice i really enjoyed it really really good so brother omar you come on back and, and, and do your thing again matter of fact we can make this a weekly thing you know uh, every week we could do it if you want to it's, it's all right with me yeah but I, I would also like to uh if, I, if if you can send me the information how I can tie in, tie in with brother uh brother Muhammad's uh program you say on Tuesday? Yeah. Yeah. If it's open, I don't know. I will I will I will uh send brother uh Maurice your uh information. I'll send it again and then he can contact you because he'll have your your email address, your telephone number and every all that type of good stuff. Yeah, feel free to call me on the phone. I'm 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 in I'm I'm open to uh talk. That's yeah. why I was gonna give it out on there. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I can just I just I can just I send it to Brother Maurice uh already. I just resend it. Okay, that'll work. And he'll be looking for it. And I even I even put it uh in your Facebook too, Brother Maurice. Okay, perfect, perfect. So so you guys can brothers can connect. On that note, I thank everybody in the chat room, my deacons. <laughs> My dick is a reality in the chat room. Always here with us. Thank you for joining us. Those who are listening and those who will listen later on. And of course, shout out to my Facebook audience. 
Uh, actually, I get more views on Facebook, really, when I share and do my thing on Facebook. But anyway, YouTube is all good, too. Until next time, I'm Angel Snuffin' Up 7. And uh, as Don Cornelius used to always say as in parting, I wish us love, peace, and so we out. We already 5,000. Where's my little button thing here so we can we get out? Yeah, that was a good panel. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely a good panel. And uh, <laughs> we can move on from there. Uh...